Welcome to the Spin Whiz Comic Show. Whoa. From Raleigh, North Carolina. Join us for exclusive interviews with the publishers, bringing you the newest titles in indie comics, web comics, movies, and more. No way. Way. And now, here's your host, Jeff Palumbo. Tonight, we have an amazing interview. Um, Brian Dorsey is on the show. So Brian is the owner of Mountaineer West Productions. And we met probably, I'm going to say about 10 months ago, if I were to take a wild guess, if I were to look back. It's about 10 months. And um, his content's fantastic. I don't want to talk about it here when I'm introducing myself. I want to bring him in to talk about it. So I want to make sure I hit the right button and bring him on in so we can talk about all this stuff. He's got not only a bunch of great content on spinwiscomics.com, but he also has a whole ton of content coming out in Kickstarter that uh, want at least one new title and another one that is a part four of one of the ones he has up on the site right now. So um, I don't want to talk about it. I want to let him talk about it because he can do it better. He's much better looking than I am as well. So for everybody watching, it's really a bonus to you. I mean, you get to hear my voice, but you get to see him. And that's, that's a big deal. So let's bring him in. Let's make sure this works properly. Brian, are you there? Yeah, how's it going? It is going wonderful. Thank you for meeting with me. I greatly appreciate it. I know that over the past two or three months, we have tried everything to connect and things kept falling through or getting crazy, just like life does. Um, yeah. And that was pre-corona. So now things are even even crazier. So thank you for jumping on the show. I appreciate your time. Uh, I think people are excited and want to know about your product that you, not only you have, what you have coming out, what's in your Kickstarter, but also... Um, where you came from, like what, how did all this happen? So let's just get right to it out of the gate, Mountaineer West productions. Tell me about it. How, where did that awesome name come from? It's a slick logo, very simplistic, but very bold. Um, how did it start? Are you creator? Are you writer? Are you, what, what, what's your, uh, your big to do? Yeah. So, um, first, thanks for having me on, um, yeah. Mountaineer West productions, I uh, came about originally, um, I kind of got started in the creative world, writing science fiction novels, um, and then got involved in a, a short film and decided we needed to kind of start looking toward like doing this as a business. And uh, the director of the short film, Justin Zimmerman, who I think you have some of his comics through. I Wave do. Um, we started uh talking about comics and some of the we're kicking stories back and forth and some of the short stories I had, he said, those will make great comic books. And, you know, I hadn't really thought about going that route with it and then just kind of give it a shot. And I really, really enjoyed doing it over the last few years. Um, it's kind of actually taken my attention away from the novels and everything else because I really enjoyed the comic books. But uh, Mountaineer West uh, came about because once I decided I was going to look at this as a business, create an LLC and all that stuff, um, had to get a name. And so I'm from West Virginia originally. I'm from like six or seven generations of coal miners. Uh, didn't, wow. want to work, didn't want to work in the coal mines. So I joined the Navy when I was 18. And uh, after 23 years, retired from that. Um, and so Mountaineer is kind of the, uh, you know, it's the the football teams, the Mountaineers. And, um, and so I went with that. I live on the West Coast now. So I just came up with Mountaineer West, and um, at the time, I was very less than proficient with Photoshop, and the M and the W on the logo was just really easy for me to do. It just worked out. <laughs> That's all right. It worked out perfect. Now, I don't know if you know, but I'm actually from Syracuse. So in oh, okay. West Virginia um, and Syracuse. Uh, uh, what was that? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I did my uh, master's at Syracuse. Oh, did you really? Yeah. So are you okay? Are you feeling all right that you were a mountaineer and then you went over to the orange? Yeah, it was uh, interesting. I actually forgot I wore a West Virginia shirt there uh, one day. Yeah, oh, trying, my. It took me a while to realize some interesting looks. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Syracuse is very cold, although I don't know if it's colder than the mountains of West Virginia. Yeah, I had a good deal with Syracuse. I was actually, when I was uh, in the Navy, the Navy paid for my master's degree. And um, it was, a, they called it a limited residency. So I did most of the work kind of distance, but you flew out there for like a month um, to six weeks every year um, to do all your like practical stuff with your professors and with the kind of cohort that they had you set up in. So 
Yeah, that's about enough time. I mean, I haven't lived there in 15 years, and uh, I had enough shoveling my driveway in May to uh, last a yeah. lifetime. So I, yeah, it was July or August. So it was just other than the humidity, it wasn't too bad. Yeah, yeah, that's the good time. So are you you are specifically a writer, correct? That's that's kind of your gist, and you hire artists on to do the work for you, or do you do both? I don't know. You wouldn't want to see anything that I drew. <laughs> so, yeah, definitely uh, following the writer or creator side of the house. Um, everything right now uh, under Minor West Productions, the the scripts, the novels, the comic books are all written by me. So. Oh, awesome. And um, what was your first title that you ever, I mean, let me step back a minute. You said that you had done novels. Did you transition any of the novels into your first or second comic? Or have they all been like, you know what, I'm going to stop know. doing novels and just do comics? Um, so none of the novels have been um, kind of uh, transferred over to uh, graphic novels or comics uh, yet. I think there's potential for that. But I, I had a bunch of other stories in my head um, that I wanted to get out and knew that the comic book graphic novel world was a much better kind of platform for that. I actually have this uh, space opera series called Gateway that I've got one book that I need to finish to wrap up the uh, series, but I've been so tied into doing these comic books for the last two years, I'm starting to get a little bit of grief from people uh, waiting on that to come out. But um, there is another uh, novella that I've written that is science fiction, and it's uh, just out digitally, but um, I've written the comic script for that. So that'll probably be the first thing that I've transitioned over to um, to the comic world. Other, the Book of Luca was originally a short story, um, but it was, uh, wasn't was really published. But that's what the base for the Book of Luca and my Third Testament kind of universe is. So it's from that short story. So do all of, let, let's go over the comics we have on Spinwiz real quick. I'm going to drop the link in for you fine folk out there that want to read some of Brian's stuff. It is great. Uh, and a lot of it right now is actually free. Uh, he has it up there. There's some things if you always say is for the stuff that he has up, that's free to read on the site. If you like it, buy the PDF, hook the man up. He's not doing this for <laughs> free. I know he likes to tell stories, but making some money on the side might be nice as well. So hook your, your fellow indie brethren up and, uh, you know, give, give toss the boys some cash. So we right now have a fabulous apocalypse couch surfing, the Book of Jessica, and I think we have five, four or five of those. Five, I think, right? Um, yeah. Book of Luca, and that is the graphic novel, and then we got into War Angels. So those are all up on Spinwiz Comics. Which of those was, you said Book of Luca was first? Yeah, that actually started out with a single issue, and then we were lucky enough to get back and to move right into the graphic novel. Um, and the Book of Luca, the Book of Jessica, and another... Um, uh, storyline in that universe uh, called the Book of Zeke, which um, just finished a Kickstarter a little while ago, so we'll be putting that out um, shortly. They're all set in this uh, supernatural post-apocalyptic world, uh, and then the Middle Ground, which I think we'll talk about later, actually is in that same universe, but it goes back to the 1600s. So. Ooh, very nice. I love comics that stay within the same universe and hop timelines. Um, I'm a big fan of Stephen King. And his Dark Tower series and how he wraps a bunch of his books through that just blew my damn mind. So uh, ever since then, I was like, oh, this is amazing. So do you do you have anybody that you've ever, uh, not written, but uh, read that you're just like, oh, my gosh, I love this guy's or girl's work? Um, yeah, I'm kind of uh, definitely more into the indie side of the comics. Like, um, um I like a little bit of like Harley Quinn, the kind of uh, Connor and Palmati uh, version of that. Um, actually love the series that's out on uh, uh, DC right now. Um, and then a little bit of Deceased uh, Universe, but mostly uh, more into like, you know, Dynamite, Boom, uh, Aftershock, like those kind of uh, uh, comic companies and the stuff that they put out. Um, so, And are your comics the way that you think about it, does it pop into your head and you're like, I'd really like to see this story and I don't know anything yet. Or is it something just, it's just scratching an itch of you'd be like, you know, it's kind of an off take of something I thought about and I just wanted to go from there. Like, how do you usually come up with stories? How do they hit you? How's that lightning strike? Yeah, it, it's, it's kind of weird. And it just, it's, I don't even know if I have a formula, just an idea will kind of hit. And honestly, like music to some degree influence, influences that a little bit when I'm Ooh. listening to it. Um, 
but um, like obviously, uh, you know, things going on, I've kind of been knocking the dust off Rage Against the Machine. Yeah. Um, and um, in the name of. Yeah. And uh, with the War Angels uh, universe, that there's some storylines that I've already kind of been thinking through. Um, and just listening to some of that music, really, I kind of see some of it actually being played out in that. So, um, yeah, just kind of is all over the place, honestly. Some things I really think I think that, hey, this would be great, but I don't really have it fleshed out yet. So I'll put a big effort into trying to build that world. And then other times I'll just be like, oh, that sounds cool. And then I'll just start writing and see where it goes. Um, the, the War Angels would start off just um, I'd caught a glimpse of the old heavy metal uh a movie and I remember liking that in a magazine and the way that it changed genres and um, just the, the kind of more in your face kind of art style with it and War Angels was kind of my attempt to, to pay a little homage to that because it's this uh, group of female warriors that have died through acts of bravery that um, have the opportunity to then fight across all these different realms um, and some of them are magical earth is like modern contemporary earth is one uh, and then some are futuristic, but they can travel between these different places, kind of fighting the forces of evil. And they each have their own kind of unique um, origin story about how they become one of these warriors. So uh, right now we've got characters that were Native American warriors in the 1870s, Celtic witches in 2400 B.C., um, a homeless girl in Los Angeles, a runaway slave in the 1850s. And they all kind of come together uh, in, in these storylines. That is awesome. And uh, did you plan on having them all kind of come together or did it, were you just like, well, damn, this would be a cool character or did you like, did, was it kind of like, I want, I know I want people from this time frame, or did you start writing? You're like, we need a, we need a Celtic witch. Like this can't be without um, a Celtic witch. Yeah. So I think it was more, I like the idea of the genre hopping, um, which, and then I kind of went from that to like, how are these warriors made, so to speak? Um, and, uh, one of my undergraduate degrees is history. And then, uh, my master's is social science with a emphasis on history and political science. So it's not too hard for me to go picking and choosing different, uh, points throughout history where I think would be, uh, interesting elements to, to pull one of these characters from. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Chris Sanigan from, that does, uh, which one does he does? He's on the site. Group of seven has the same type of historical background and he does kind of the same stuff with his. Yours is obviously drastically different. His is wartime, but yours kind of does. I think genre hopping is probably the best way to say it. And it's such a great, fun, quick story that by the end of it, you're like, well, wait, what? I want more. And so that that has to be a good hook. You must be hearing that from a lot of people because you, your Kickstarter is doing wonderful. Yeah, it's um, getting good feedback on the Kickstarters. Uh, when we were having the cons, I was getting good feedback. And yeah, I just want it to be kind of like some of the storylines. There's uh, some of my stuff is kind of like on the darker side, but like more like this is just stuff that happens in the world. But um, like in War Angels, uh, the graphic novel, which is really the first three kind of chapters, um, are you know you get to see the world through the eyes of this uh, girl that's coming into this uh, group, and it starts out in like Arizona, and she's in this kind of rough uh, home situation, and she ends up leaving, living on the streets in Los Angeles, and then uh, she wakes up in this magical world of Haven where like magic is real and there's fairies and all this stuff. But then it ends in a shootout in a bar in LA. So <laughs> way to wrap it up. And you know, it is, if it is LA, then God knows what was in one of those drinks and they're, you know, <laughs> she could have, she could have thought there's fairies everywhere. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, well, listen, let's talk next about, and I already, I already loaded the, the link in. So for those of you that are watching on YouTube, um, don't worry about the links. You obviously can't see them in the chat, but you can see them below. So just scroll down, click on it, and we're going to have the Kickstarter in there also. Just click on it, support our boy. That's all. Go check it out. You'll love it. I promise. Um, so let's talk about the middle ground. Now I'm going to drop this link in here also. The middle ground looks and feels from the Kickstarter quite a bit different. Um, do you want to tell us how you came about this one? Because I don't. You said that yeah. it does tie in or doesn't tie in to your. It, it does tie into the same 
universe as the book of Jessica, book of Luca, and the book of Zeke. Um, and in that it's this uh, kind of never ending battle between good and evil, uh, angels and demons, and all these different um, kind of spirits. Uh, Jessica and Luca and Zeke are set in the modern world, but it's post apocalyptic. So, like, the the Battle of Armageddon has already happened, and there's survivors that are left, and some of them were given powers by angels, uh, and um, so they're kind of the trying trying to survive, the, trying to keep the last few groups of humans that are out there alive. And then the greater story, there's kind of this underlying movement that they realize has taken place, and that kind of sets the stage for the the book of elements of the third um, testament universe. Uh, the middle ground, though, um, initially. It came as an independent idea, and then I thought about it, and I was like, that fits in perfectly with this third testament. And what it does is, uh, while I was writing the Luca and Jessica books, I, I was very cognizant of the fact that, like, the, the storyline is very kind of Judeo-Christian. It's like uh, Catholic uh, angels and demons are, are kind of the main players in it. But that doesn't really represent everyone's kind of belief system. Um, and so I wanted to go back and when I got this idea for the middle ground, it just fit perfectly. So the concept for the middle ground is, um, early colonization, uh, we're talking about Roanoke and Jamestown, uh, what the middle ground shows is that while at the same time, the struggle started between native Americans and Europeans for control of the new world, there was also a battle going on between European demons and native American spirits. Um, Damn. And, in, and in between that, there's our kind of our group of heroes who are aware of this battle. And they're kind of the prototype of the hero characters you see in Luca and Jessica. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that just kicks off basically the the mystery around a disappearance of people at Roanoke. They were actually attacked by uh, Wendigos, uh, which are Native American uh spirits and that's what destroyed the village and then jamestown there was an actual uh battle took there took place there in 1622 but i twist that to put a supernatural edge on it and um after that battle kind of our our hero types show up um and that's kind of where we set the stage for the middle ground that is awesome and you keep how the hell do you keep this all straight in your head um I don't know. I keep. I take a lot of notes. I got a lot of spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, I, you must have like full, like full on uh, flow charts as to how something like this must tie together and when. I mean, when you're creating something like this, do you use visuals like that to start help and kind of create your timelines? Because it's it's very timeline specific. Like you're not, you're not just throwing something out there that could be any time. You are super specific to a date that has happened in the past so you have to be able to correlate with that i mean do you how do you do all that because that's really hard yeah i think uh part of it's cheating for me with the history background so it's real easy for me to say oh 1622 um but uh, a lot of it is kind of muscle memory back from the time that i've spent writing the novels because like with my space opera series i've got um four uh, novels a novella and a prequel in that and you've got to keep track of what's going on once you get to that many mm -hmm. uh, in the same story or you just, you know, I'll start to freak out over some tertiary character of like, what color were their eyes? I can't remember. It was two books ago. And and so, uh, yeah, I've got a lot of spreadsheets for stuff like that. And then with the comics, um, I kind of have a little more of outlines or character summaries. Um, and because it is so visual, it's a lot easier to flip back and look at that graphic novel just to kind of recenter myself. Um, as I'm moving forward. So it's not as uh, time consuming in terms of like the amount of like pure data that I have to reserve as the novels, but there is some of that there. That's amazing. Yeah. I don't think, I mean, I have written um, my comic is Chimera, which is a psychological thriller. And I have, again, to your point, it is kind of over the length of 20 episodes. It is sort of genre hopping, but not to your extent. And I don't have to tie everything in like you do. So it blows my mind. And it sounds like you have it down to a science. It almost is. Like it is a, it's an operational efficiency of writing. Yeah. Um, again, kind of part of the day job stuff. I learned a lot of that through the time in the military. I'm also um, 
a project manager and an engineer uh, as part of my my day job currently. So all that kind of has been kind of beat into me as well. So yeah, well, thank you for your service uh, okay. for all those watching. I'm I'm a big supporter of our our military and our veterans, so I appreciate it. Um, so that's another reason why you got to hook them up. You know, help help our boys out that uh, help put their lives on the line for us to keep freedom free. And um, so. With this Kickstarter, how much longer do you have? So it's the 24th right now. It yeah. looks like we have, what, another 11 days to go? Yeah, I only ran that one for uh, 15 days. Uh, some of the more recent ones, I'm running for a shorter period of time just because of the mechanics of the way that the Kickstarters run. You get a pretty good push at first, and you get a little boost at the end, and then in the middle it's just kind of kind of hit or miss. A lot of these we're running because we just – uh, you know, we're taking a little bit of a revenue hit from the cons not taking place right now. Seriously, And so we are run kind of a quick series of like three Kickstarters over the last several months, uh, really focusing on getting, getting the funds to print more books and things like that. So we, we're not running it for a huge amount. Um, and so I just ran it for a shorter period of time. We move into the War Angels number four, which takes off where the, where it picks up where the volume one graphic novel ends. We'll run that in August or so, and that'll probably be for, you know, three or four grand or something. But that's uh, going back to we're we're basically creating that one from scratch without any content already in place um, that we've already paid for, so to speak. So yeah, well, I, I mean, I want you to come back on the show if you will. Oh when, yeah. When that Kickstarter is up, because I think we want to do that, and then we'll talk about where the middle ground has gone. And I think you're, I think that this is going to be something that people are really going to enjoy. Uh, I think people like period pieces with a twist. I think it's the same reason why people like the Oz, um, the Oz genre with all the twists mm -hmm. that happen with that. Yeah. So, uh, and I'm I'm a nut. I love like the old stories from Jamestown and things of that nature, and the odd, the spooky oddity of it, and how it just poof, like just gone. So yeah. I, I think that a lot of that mysticism you're tying into allows people to be like, you know what? That could work. Like it just, it's something that you tie in nicely. And I think that's going to be an amazing story for people to latch onto. Thanks. Yeah. I'm looking forward. I'm having a lot of fun with that. I actually started on the second issue in terms of writing it. I actually finished it and, and talks with the artist to, to start it. Um, but yeah, I, I've got some interplay between the demons, uh, the European demons and the native American spirits, like interactions with them and then look kind of like our heroes. Uh, one of them is Pocahontas, but actually used one of her um, actual Native American and Algonquin names, which is Amanute. Um, and she's effectively this prototype of a ranger that you see later on in, in the Book of series um, where she can actually transform into an animal. Um, and um, so she's one of these, these groups of heroes. There's a uh, classical kind of soldier of fortune uh, who um, you'll find out later has, has been given some special powers. There's a Dominican priest who can exercise demons. Uh, and then there's a um, Ellis Mather, which is, I kind of made the character up, but she's a sister to the Mather family, which is a prominent family of uh, ministers in colonial America and uh, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. But she is effectively like a vessel of God. Um, and so like, uh, she's kind of at one point, she's a medium who can like talk to the dead, but, um, she also is basically has a protection of an archangel as well, Damn. Uh, because she's going to effectively be a future saint. Um, uh, and then once they get there, I'm adding another character who's effectively a white witch, who's, which is kind of in between both sides. So she's more just like the balance between good and evil instead of one side or the other. So, mm -hmm. Those are the kind of the big players uh, in that storyline. So far. I love it. I love it. Well, if you ever need a a quote unquote person in the past, my uncle was actually the one who led the people from the Mayflower over oh, to. Wow. I mean, he stayed in Holland, mm -hmm. and his whole crew actually went over on the Mayflower. Like, hmm. there's there's a grave for him in Holland and everything. It's crazy. So if you ever need info, you cool. know. Not that you would, I mean, I, don't, I think he just was a priest. Like, I don't know if there's anything cool about him. You know, that was quite quite a ways away. But, uh, yeah, I got all sorts of weird, crazy stuff in my family like that. 
Yeah, and I definitely don't have issues. Like, I, I kind of like tying in uh, people from like you know friends, family, acquaintances, and things. And like through one of the artists, actually, um, there's a, a model in Russia that he was friends with. She's been in Cosmopolitan, Vogue, uh, Playboy. Her name's uh, Olga uh, Alberti, and um, he's like, man, I really want to draw her uh, for uh, one of the covers. And I was like, well, you got to talk to her and get permission and all that stuff first. And she was super excited about it. And I said, well, hey, let me just make you a character. So she's got, she's actually one of the main characters in this War Angels universe now. Uh, wow. With like direct tie-in. So it's her, her origin story is she's a Russian sniper uh, defending Leningrad when she becomes one of these warriors. So, that is and which is great because her family is from Leningrad. So, oh, wow. Did you know that before you put that together or was it? No, no, it just worked out. <laughs> oh my God. Gosh, that's awesome. And it doesn't hurt to have a little bit of influencer on the inside giving you a push either. Yeah, yeah. B bummer about that. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it must be a bummer. Anyway, well, listen, man, and um, where did you, just real quick before we go, I know that a lot of us work two jobs. We usually have a daytime job, and then we have our comics job, which is most of us. And one of the things is that we find, at least I find, is the most difficult, not because it's a bad thing, just because it's hard because we all work two jobs, is networking and finding the people you want to work with. Are you consistently finding that you're using the same artists over and over, or are you switching up, or how is that working? Um, so I have kind of a group of artists that I use, mostly that I met through the convention circuit. Mm -hmm. um, there's Kevin McCoy, who's worked for Zinescope. He actually did the Seahawks logo. David Ocampo has done work for Heavy Metal and uh, Marvel. Um, Tony Doya is working for me. DC Alonzo does colors. He's just got a gig with uh, Heavy Metal. Um, Silvano Beltramo works with T-Pub. Omi Rimalani's done a ton of uh, different stuff um, for Marvel, DC, uh, all those guys. Uh, Justin Hunt did a couple covers for me and he did a lady death cover and most of those are either through uh, the convention circuit or them knowing someone and also there's a Facebook page called connecting comic book artists and writers huh. um, and it's got thousands of different artists and writers are on it and you can just go on there and say I'm looking for someone for a project I can pay this much per page uh, this is the timeline that I need it done in please post your portfolio below um, and so I've got probably a third of my artists off of there. And these are people that are working for uh, some of the larger independents. And some of them are even working for like Marvel and DC as well. But, you know, just like creators, you know, comic books aren't a huge return on investment. Uh, and it's the sure. same thing for writers or for artists. So um, you can get some really, really good artists on, on that page. Awesome. Well, if I ever... Uh knock the dust off Chimera or the three others that I want to write when I'm not running an entire company, then, yeah. um, then I will most definitely look into that. So, um, well, listen, man, I mean, that's pretty much it. Like I told you, we tried to get a half an hour we're like 29 minutes and 11 seconds in. Okay. So cool. it, it's almost perfect. Uh, anything else you want to talk about before we take off? Um, I think, uh, probably, uh, with Pride Month wrapping up, uh, the a fabulous apocalypse piece. Yep. Because it's just my idea. I took like the most ludicrous kind of fear that someone would have about the LGBT community and turned that into an apocalyptic kind of satirical thing. Um, and it's written as kind of a one-off, but um, it's just uh, the whole concept is that like um, there's this kind of convergence of gay energy that makes being gay uh, <laughs> contagious. Mm -hmm. And then it's just, you know, it's just it's, it's very similar to like the COVID chaos and all that stuff that takes place. Um, so it's completely satirical, but um, it is Pride Month, so it's probably one we could uh, talk about a little bit. Yeah. Well, well I'll tell you what. Um, I will, for those of you who are watching live, uh, tomorrow I'll have that up on the homepage. And for those of you on YouTube, just go to spinoscomics.com and it'll be in the first or second slot by the time this is up on YouTube. And get it up there. Read it if you like it. Buy it. That's all we ask. And then, um, obviously, Brian, you and I have to talk a little bit more offline about um, our app coming, so you know more about that. And print on demand that will help potentially help you quite a bit, because uh, then there's no inventory costs. So yeah. all sorts of really cool stuff going that um, I want to be able to help the indie community with. And you have such amazing content 
it, that I want to make sure that we can highlight you as much as we can. So uh, I think yeah. people are going to want really like your stuff. I think they're going to take one piece and then just start mowing down on the rest of it because they like it so much. So um, thanks for being here, man. It was great getting to know you. It's the first time we've gotten a chance to talk. At the yeah. very latest, I will talk to you in August um, when you're running your next Kickstarter. But in the meantime, go check out the Kickstarter for the middle ground right now. It's got 11 days left. By the time this comes out on YouTube, it's probably going to be seven days left because we're going to try to fast track this one. Go check it out. But even if you don't, he's all over spinwizcomics.com. He's got a ton of great content. Go read it. Go check it out. Leave comments. If you like it, buy it and then put it on YouTube or put it on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and all those other things to show them you like them. And that's it. So, um, Brian, hang out with me real quick. I'm going to sign off with everybody. And uh, I will be right back in one minute. Hang with me, Brian. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was Brian Dorsey. What a great dude. Uh, super creative. It blows my mind just how creative and well done independent comic creators can be because they're not telling the stories that are stopping inside the box that Marvel and DC kind of have to go in. Not that there's anything wrong with Marvel and DC, but guys like Brian get to go outside of those bounds that they, he knows does not fit inside that box. And that's why I love indie comics so much. And there's so much talent here. Um, go check it out. That's our show for tonight. We will have somebody on again on Sunday. I don't know who it is because I don't have my list up, um, but check it out. And again, check on YouTube, spinwiscomics.com has all the links. Uh, check out our social media. We, when this goes up on uh, YouTube, we'll make sure we tweet it and share it and all sorts of fun stuff. And we hope to see you again next time. We'll see you Sunday. Have a great night. This is Jeff Blumbo from the Spinwiz Comic Show. Thanks for being here. Talk to you soon.